there. I'm Janet Kovac McLaren, soft tissue surgeon and clinical director at London Vet Specialists. Today I'm going to be running through um, information about brachycephalic airway disease. So, as you all know, more and more common for us to be seeing brachycephalic patients in the hospital, um, and more and more common for these patients to require surgery coming in for rep respiratory distress um, that uh, can unfortunately impact their quality of life and um, require medical management or surgical intervention. Um, at London Vet Specialists, we're um, the only specialist referral center in uh, central London and um, again, something we're well versed and able to handle. Um, so something we see frequently in our hospital. Um, again, this is going to be a two-part seminar. I'll kind of give you some updates in brachycephalic airway disease. Um, and then uh, the surgical intern at London Vet Specialists will go ahead and give information about the gastrointestinal relationship and consequences in these patients um, that have brachycephalic airway disease. So um, we don't want to dwell too much um, on the background information. I think we're all pretty well aware of the anatomic abnormalities that exist in brachycephalic patients. Um, most of the patients we see fall into the category of English bulldogs, French bulldogs, and pugs, although um, some other patients are um, also represented. Um, really important to know how to handle these patients when there is an emergency and what's required um, and how to be prepared for emergency situations. Uh, we'll talk about some of the surgical interventions, uh, more traditional and newer techniques that have come forward. And also, um, again, the second part of our talk, we'll ta uh, discuss the gastrointestinal diseases that are seen in these patients how that relates to the respiratory disease and how surgery for the respiratory disease can help improve some of the gastrointestinal syndromes and symptoms that we see. So how does severe brachycephalic disease affect dog's life? Um, well, to put things uh, certainly in uh, a patient or owner's perspectives, um, you know, so many of these patients have physical signs of heat intolerance, um, what we call uh, reluctance to exercise. They'll go to the park and they'll want to sit on the corner um, rather than um, running and playing at full speed. Certainly snoring is something that most owners will report to you. Uh, sleep problems, so some very you know close equivalents to sleep apnea that you would see in the human side of things is reported in these patients. And the biggest impact too is on um, the quality and the length of these animals' lives. So I believe it's on the next slide, but um, the kind of regular expected lifespan of most patients that are non-brachycephalic can be on average 12 years. But a recent study showed that brachycephalic animals actually can anticipate only living to about eight years of age. So that's a pretty significant change in not only the quality of life, but also the, the length of life that, that um, these patients see. So certainly, um, certainly severe. So um, a huge study looked at, um, you know, almost 200,000 brachycephalic dogs and regular dogs that, that are presented in the United Kingdom to primary care veterinarians. Um, and they looked at the brachycephalic dogs, as I mentioned, having a longevity of only around eight to eight and a half years of age. Um, rather than regular or non-brachycephalic group of dogs who live to about 12.7 years of age. So um, when they looked at all of the effects of age, body weight, sex, neutering, et cetera, uh, brachycephalic dogs have about three and a half times the odds of developing respiratory disorders. Um, another study looked at um, an interesting finding is that about 50%, 40 to 50% of brachycephalic dogs did present with some sort of respiratory crisis, but half the brachycephalic dogs at least will have an actual crisis episode. Um, about 20 or 25% of all brachycephalic pets will undergo surgery of some sort for the respiratory tract. The important thing to remember is that people are quite loyal to these pets. They have a lovely temperament most of the time. Um, and again, in another owner study looked at owners of these brachycephalic dogs and um, uh, the, the pug 
owners especially, as well as the French Bulldogs, the English Bulldogs were still quite likely, despite the crisis, despite the surgery, the associated costs and the lack of the longevity, were still very likely to uh, have these dogs again and recommend them to their friends. So um, uh, certainly not something that's going to be going away anytime soon. In terms of what the anatomy looks like in this area, um, it's a multi-level obstruction. This is what we explain uh, at our first visit and consultation with the owners. So a regular patient has a pretty robust airway. You can see in a brachycephalic animal, just not a lot of room or real estate for airflow to get through. So there's an undersized cranium, there's shortened bones, uh, missing or kind of compressed frontal sinuses, aberrant growth of all the nasal bones or conchi, and it's a multi-level obstruction. So it starts at the nostrils, it in, enters into the nasal cavity, down to the, the palatal level. Um, the tongue can be something that can cause uh, an impact on uh, the macroglossia, which we'll discuss, that can also impact the airflow. The pharyngeal area, even their tonsils can be obstructed or get in the way. And certainly as we move more caudally, uh, the trachea can be hypoplastic and more narrowed than it should be. So what do these patients sound like on examination? Let's see. And that's an example of some mild affectedly dog, uh, mild affected pug. And uh, an example of a more severely affected bulldog. Uh, certainly these are both just at rest. So after a quick trot down the street or, um, or up a flight of stairs, that can be exacerbated and much worse. So there's no way from the outside to evaluate these patients. You really do require a full sedated laryngeal examination in order to assess the airways. So generally speaking, if we have a high suspicion that these patients are going to require surgery, instead of having them come to the hospital for multiple examinations and hospitalizations, we usually have them set up and ready for a sedated laryngeal examination to be followed pretty quickly um, afterwards by surgery. So we'll take a look at some examples of what we might expect on our pre-surgical um, pre laryngeal examinations. <laughs> Again, pretty severely affected from the time of induction. We always have oxygen and our emergency drugs and um, suction, everything, which we'll discuss in a bit, prepared and ready to go for our examinations. What does the airway examination look like once patients are sedated? We'll show some examples of what we can expect. Um, essentially, we're looking at the uh, nasal area generally before they're asleep. And then once they're sedated, we can uh, uh, more safely evaluate the larynx and pharynx. So typical sounding examination. able to see there um, the overlong soft palate um, and uh, the really increased work of breathing and stertor associated with these patients. Again, um, best to be prepared in case there are any emergencies and these patients are to have anything um, stressful happen. We have our respiratory um, emergency drugs as well as our endotracheal tubes ready to go. So what is the 
the gold standard for making the diagnosis in these patients. Um, certainly the sedated laryngeal exam using laryngoscopy or a um, endoscopic examination to assess the airway can be a very useful tool. We often do imaging to make sure, A, that there's no concurrent issues that um, are affecting the upper airway or the pulmonary chest cavity. And CT scan MRIs can be very helpful at visualizing the um, abnormal anatomy. Um, the real new gold standard as to what normal and abnormal is has been developed with this kind of fancy box you see right here, which is called a, a whole body plethysmography or WBBP machine. And essentially what happens, and we'll review some in more detail, but these patients are not sedated. They can sit in this gentle chamber um, and uh, quite nicely measures um, the barometric pressure oscillations within the chest, within the, the patient, um, and gives us a BOAS index, essentially. Um, so they looked at these patients. Um, they were able to correlate um, the grade of brachycephalic disease, and the um, a cutoff value for a BOAS index was established. And the really interesting thing is, um, quite important, is that Although uh, we, we saw that there was a change in the BOAS index in many of these patients, up to 60% of the owners didn't even recognize that their patient was clinically abnormal until um, they were placed in the machines and there was an assessment done. So, so what happens when these patients come in an emergency? Generally, the first and most important thing is to relieve their stress if they're hyperthermic and make sure we sedate them and tranquilize them, always having our... Um, airway, safely protected, mask oxygenation can be a nice way to go, but it can be very stressful. Um, so um, and you need a lot of personnel and also, often we can um, uh, cause more issues with hyperthermia because the, the CO2 can also increase if there's too tight of a seal with those um, mask oxygenation. So better, if you can, to use an oxygen cage or nasal prongs to administer oxygen to these patients. Again, Steroids can be indicated if there is a lot of swelling of the airway and keeping these patients sedate and tranquilized to um, remove the, uh, the stress element as well. Um, we really try to avoid tracheostomy because there is a pretty high rate of complications. Certainly, if you're unable to get an airway, um, then there is um, the option of having to do a tracheostomy in order to bypass um, before, during, or after surgery if we're really concerned about airway swelling. Uh, many of these emergency patients do require chest radiographs or chest imaging because they can often have aspiration pneumonia. We'll talk about how um, these patients may have a history of regurgitation and gastrointestinal diseases. And certainly they can develop non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema essentially from choking um, an upper airway obstruction so severe that pulmonary edema does develop. So what do we do with surgery and how can we address these patients? Certainly, we'll talk um, a little bit about client expectations because it's a multimodal repair, but there are some parts of the anatomy that can be fixed, and there's some parts that are fixed and unable to be addressed with surgery. So certainly, the nares can be wide, widened. Um, there are newer techniques that address the abnormal nasal terminates. We can trim the palate here, as you see, back generally to the level of the soft palate. Um, sometimes, very enlarged tonsils can be removed. As we move down the larynx, we can remove everted laryngeal saccules, but things like the trachea being hypoplastic are fixed and unable to be uh, addressed with surgery. Um, if there's laryngeal collapse, also unable to be addressed with surgery. Um, and there may be some benefit or change, um, improvements we can make to their gastrointestinal diseases. So first and most obvious change we see in these patients is stenosis of their external nares. Um, this, the nares are uh, non-mobile and they are filled in with extra tissue. As we move beyond them, their nasal conchi just behind the area of the nares um, are abnormal in 100% of the patients and their uh, rostral conchi are abnormal and about half have a barren caudal conchi. A recent study looked at the breathing dynamics and the uh, changes in French Bulldogs that have stenosis, and there actually was a 20 times higher airflow resistance in these patients compared to normal airway patients. But the good thing is that if we do address these with surgery, we can see an improvement in that resistance to airflow.
So stenotic nares repair, quite simply, um, is a rhinoplasty. And it does appear that if we could do this at a young age, and we often will combine this with their neutering, we can significantly reduce the upper airway obstruction and potentially prevent the progression of disease. So um, the technique of choice is generally um, an air layer fold resection uh, or a punch biopsy technique. So the wedge recession is a, a pretty standard technique where we uh, prepare their nares, and I'll show this in detail. And we take a wedge out of the lateral portion um, or horizontal portion, depending on your um, patient anatomy, and we make a deep extension into the cartilage and try to resect a, a portion of the airway so we can improve or open up that nares. So I'll show some pictures, but what I like to do is use the cotton buds in the nares as I'm uh, uh, doing surgery that absorbs some of the bleeding, also gives me a nice kind of open shape of the, of the nares to suture around. I use an absorbable suture um, and I put lots of extra throws in my stitches because I don't want them to lick them out. It's certainly important to have a buster collar on these patients so they don't take out the stitches uh, prematurely. Punch biopsy technique can be used in dogs, gives you a nice round and symmetric area so the punch biopsy is done. Um, you get a nice deep wedge and then you close that. A really nice technique in little kittens as well too that's been shown up, um, written up before because you can use just a small three millimeter punch and make a nice improvement in the airway for kittens. So a little bit about what it looks like when we prepare these patients for surgery. Um, generally they are intubated and then uh, we'll do our airway examination, um, assess what's going to happen uh, following our um, nares repair. This dog has an extra long soft palate that will need to be addressed. Um, you can do local blocks. Um, that can help numb the area around the nose and provide some extra analgesia of this as well. And then finally, a little sterile prep of the nose once the animal is intubated. Uh, often these patients have facial fold dermatitis issues that will need to be addressed as well. Um, and as I said, um, you know, this is uh, not the most sterile technique just based on the the area that we're surgery doing surgery on so we do our best to do a nice sterile prep um, making sure the patients are symmetrically placed on the table as well so nice tape over their head to make sure that they're um, steady and as i said not having any kind of issues with tilting one way or the other that can affect your um, anatomy and affect what the uh, closure will look like when you're done So Nary's repair, what does that look like? As I said, I use the cotton buds to assist me in my um, surgical um, placement. I can also use that to cut gently against. And I make just a gentle wedge with a 15 blade. Um, and again, trying to make them even, of course, can be quite tricky. I try not to grasp any of the area of the nose that's not being removed. So I use my forceps just on the wedge that's being removed. And then again, suturing and opening up that airway. And you can see, uh, not too much bleeding, but there will be some bleeding expected. And then again, using the cotton buds does help a lot in terms of absorbing some of the blood and also making sure your airway is open and um, gives you a nice kind of lateral tension to suture against, which is quite nice as well. And then finally, I then repeat, you can see already that the one side is a fit, fit more significantly open than the next. Repeat on the left side, taking a wedge with our 15 blade. Again, uh, this is one of those surgeries that's more art than science. Again, trying to grasp just the little bit wedge of tissue that's being removed, not the rest of the airway, and taking a pretty significant deep wedge is able of the tissue. Um, again, um, trying to make these patients as symmetric and beautiful as possible is ideal. It's not always possible, but um, and most patients and clients are quite pleased with the um, appearance. I usually warn people, show them some photos before and after, so they have an idea of what to expect. Um, again, the stitches do stay in place for, um, usually I tell people within six to eight weeks, those will go away. Um, but just to anticipate those don't have to come out. If they are really irritating the patients, we can remove them. But most of the times they'll stay in place for um, the entire um, six to eight week period without causing any problems. And Often or occasionally, patients will lick out or remove uh, the stitches. We use a buster collar. We start with soft cones. If they're able to get around or away from that, then sometimes we have to go to 
um, the hard cone. So before and after pictures, so this is a large English bulldog with a pretty synodic nares on the left, and you can see afterwards on the right a pretty significant improvement um, in the uh, aperture and the width of the nares after. So soft palate hyperplasia, again, is going to be the most common um, anomaly that's seen in 85, and I would say almost 100% in my um, visualization as well. It's not just an elongation of the palate, as you can see here, Here's the tip of the end of the tonsils, and this dog has about a centimeter or two of excess tissue at the end. These also have, um, they're quite thick, so three and a half times thicker tissue than normal dogs. Someone looked at the CT measurements, which you can use to image the palate. Um, and they also have looked at the histology and found that um, there's hyperplasia of the um, stroma within these, uh, the soft uh, palate tissue. So uh, less muscle, more thickening of the, um, the, um, the glandular tissue of the soft palate. So um, uh, this is something with a staphylectomy or shortening of the soft palate um, that can be done either in the traditional kind of cut and sew method. People have used laser. Um, I particularly like to use the bipolar sealing device or ligature in my hands that works really well. So I keep them in sternal recumbency. Um, I'll show you some, some pictures of how, videos how we uh, deploy that device. And in my hand, it's quick, um, diminishes bleeding. Uh, lasers have been reported, but you see you do get a fair bit of char when you use a laser, and there is some more danger and laser safety issues to consider. So again, in our technique of choice is the using the small dog jaw ligature. Um, again, I don't fully deploy, so you get to hear kind of a little bit of a note of um, beeping, but it's within really minutes to seconds, we extubate these patients for this portion of the procedure. And it takes a few repeated deployments, but um, it is done within seconds. Uh, as I said, you get it ready. We are able to both thin out, this is a really long palate, thin out the soft palate, especially the thick ones, takes a little bit of extra grafting. once you've done one pass and see if there's any extra tissue that needs to be addressed. But again, within 30 seconds or so, this is done and that tissue is removed. Again, another visualization of how quick and easy this procedure is. And as I said, um, I'll show some after shots, but you can get uh, at least a centimeter or two of this tissue removed fairly quickly. So. Uh, what does it look like afterwards? Hopefully a nice open airway here. Um, this palate is significantly shortened. You can see minimal to no bleeding um, and a lot uh, larger and uh, much more normal aperture available to us. So some tips and tricks. Again, try not to pull the tongue too much because it can cause some swelling of the tongue, but also can affect your landmarks of the, the tonsil. New studies show that the younger the patients are, um, less than two years of age, um, they're going to do better than the older. So if you can catch these patients early, um, we have a really good outcome. So about 90% of patients that have staphylectomies have reported to have an excellent outcome. So older dogs and those that do have averted saccules, which is the beginning of laryngeal collapse, are going to have a worse prognosis. We'll talk about some newer techniques, which is a palatoplasty, which is, has been described, and that can sometimes be useful if it's a really bulky or thick area of the palate that needs to be removed. So um, the issue we have here is, is, is um, most of the studies are retrospective, uh, but they do look at this folded flop palatoplasty as a technique that shows pretty few complications. Um, these patients sometimes do have to have tracheostomies performed. Um, the follow-up time, unfortunately, is a bit short, uh, but they, they do also show a great clinical improvement after this technique is utilized. Um, and the goal is, again, to decrease just the length and the thickness of the palate. So I don't have great photos, but essentially um, there's an incision made so we can excise or remove the tissue of the palate and then stitch it back together again. So instead of just shortening, it's thinning out of the palate as well, too. So um, next level down is the pharynx. Um, this is a tricky area because um, all of these can lead to further obstructions. We've removed the dang dangling soft palate. 
as we go down the next area of the pharynx, there can just be hyperplastic nasopharyngeal mucosa, micro, macroglossia, big tongue, um, and kind of just swollen and edematous tissue. And this was what can be quite tricky because this is not an area where we can do much in terms of uh, surgery, but sometimes things like steroids can help um, in terms of reducing edema. Um, We'll talk a little bit about epiglottal entrapment. Um, that may be a contributing factor. Uh, the tonsils, maybe, again, I'm not really convinced that this makes a huge difference. As you can see here, this dog has pretty severely everted tonsils that are enlarged. Um, they didn't do a randomized case control study, but they did show that in some of the patients, if we resect the tonsils, we can increase the opening and the amount of airflow um, uh, to the, the area of the, the pharynx. An epiglottic entrapment is something that happens um, in brachycephalic and non-brachycephalic uh, breeds. It's actually more common in non-brachycephalic dogs, um, probably a, a talk for another day. But these dogs that have just epiglottal entrapment don't have this kind of constant work of breathing. People um, with patients with epiglottal retroversion generally uh, record that it's almost like a reverse sneeze type syndrome where they um, catch their breath in the middle of the night, have kind of an episode of spontaneous breathing and airway obstruction um, and a respiratory crisis. But if it does happen in brachycephalic pets, generally what will happen is we fix all of the things that we traditionally would do in brachycephalic pets. These patients still have episodes of crisis reported. Um, and if we see on our airway examination that the epiglottis is being um, trapped by the palate, even though the palate is of normal or shortened length, it's something that we potentially can repair by literally tacking the epiglottis down to the base of the tongue. More frequently, we'll see laryngeal disease, which is uh, averted laryngeal saccules or laryngoceles here. And as you can see, these averted saccules can do a pretty uh, significant blockage of this airway. So in this case, about half the airway is being blocked by these averted saccules. And this is the first stage of laryngeal collapse. So laryngeal collapse is when we lose the rigidity of the airway. Um, and have chondromalacia, which um, is quite a difficult situation to overcome because uh, there's not really a fix or surgical cure for it. So grade one, laryngeal collapse is eversion of these saccules. And we'll see as laryngeal di um, disease progresses, um, collapse can um, include the, uh, the rest of the larynx as well. So just averted saccules, just a quick talk. It's, it's um, something that can be removed with scissors or electrocautery. Um, there is a bit of controversy about the safety and efficacy. One recent study did show that patients that had their laryngeal saccules removed maybe had a worse prognosis. Difficult to say because dogs that have averted saccules are probably more severely affected. So it's quite difficult to say if it's the actual presence of the saccules or the removal of the saccules that led to these patients having a worse prognosis. When we do remove them, there is some possibility that they can regrow or web across the ventral larynx, and that's one of the side effects or downsides. But essentially, these uh, these little averted bits of tissue that sit in the ventral part of the larynx can be trimmed with scissors, grasped gently. Um, the biggest side effect of this can be bleeding. So again, always important to make sure you have suction available um, to make sure there's no excess bleeding. Um, tracheal hypoplasia or narrowed trachea is not something that can be fixed. So um, the CT is a great way um, of measuring this. Um, you can also just observe it on your regular chest radiographs. But at this point, no repair available. So unlike tracheal collapse, which can be managed potentially with stenting or um, placing of external rings, tracheal hypoplasia, or just a narrow trachea, it doesn't have a surgical fix to it at this stage. So something to document and mention to owners, but not something that's going to be fixable, unfortunately. So again, quick quiz, we've kind of touched on this. What is end-stage brachycephalic disease? Um, people always get this confused. So no, it's not laryngeal paralysis. That's going to be your roaring Labradors of elderly age that, that present um, to you for collapse. That's not this. Um, tracheal collapse. Nope, that's your Yorkies with the goose honk um, that uh, potentially will need medical or surgical intervention. Tracheal paralysis. No, that doesn't exist. Actually, is it is uh, answer C, tracheal collapse. So what are the stages of tracheal collapse? As we mentioned, kind of stage one is just eversion of those laryngeal saccules there um, that cause a blockage of the airway. Progresses to collapse where the uh, retinoid cartilages will start to touch on each other. Um, and you can see the quite significant narrowed 
airway. And then stage three or severe collapse is when the cartilages sort of start to crumble or fall on each other. And again, unfortunately, we often do see these patients come to us, even at young age now, that are already in stage two to three to laryngeal collapse. So some examples of what this might look like on presentation. It's a pretty severe airway stress and obstruction noted in these patients. And what does it look like on it? For example, you can see really significant folding and softening of those laryngeal cartilages. So you see the averted saccule stage one and the cartilage is starting to touch each other. So this is a definitely a grade two, maybe grade two into three collapse. So can anything be done? Well, the, the one thing we can do is fix the fixable. So it's still important to do our nares, trim our soft palate, remove the saccules, and we can see some improvement, um, even in dogs um, that have collapsed. It definitely can see some, some help. One study looked at a retinoid lateralization. It's pretty much out of favor now. There was some improvement, just a small group of dogs without a long-term follow-up. Um, but the problem is it's a pretty um, dynamic process. And so just holding the airway open um, is going to lead to complications such as aspiration pneumonia in many of these patients. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, it's a degenerative process and, and not something we can do a lot about. There are some people who've tried different stenting techniques, um, but of course we get to the point in some of these patients that are quite severely affected where a permanent tracheostomy might be needed. So um, this is a way to really manage the most severe cases. Um, it doesn't have a great survival time. These patients that had a, a long-term permanent tracheostomy to help with laryngeal collapse survived about 100 days, um, but there are a lot of complications, aspiration pneumonias, revision, um, and there is a short-term really marked improvement in the quality of life, but it's a lot of demanding care at home for these patients. So they, people have to be fairly dedicated uh, before we kind of recommend this. So some newer techniques to address this disease um, include um, removal or laser ablation of the, um, the nasal conchi. So they've looked um, in a, a few studies of um, using laser ablation to literally go in through the nares and laser the aberrant conchi out. Uh, the biggest issue is um, that they often have to have this procedure repeated. So there's not really a lot of complications, which is really good news. Um, there can be some bleeding, pretty low rate of overall mortality, but uh, you know, about 20, 15, 20% may need this done multiple times, but it is something that can be done in combination with traditional surgery, if we record this being an issue on our CT scan, or something can be done as kind of a second stage procedure if we're not happy with the results of the first. Um, again, before and after shots, aberrant uh, conchi seen here, and then after the lasering, you can see there's a little bit more airway real estate, a little more room for airflow once we have um, the, the airways lasered out. The most encouraging news is that surgery does seem to help. Um, we'll talk about how surgery um, does improve gastrointestinal diseases in these patients, but really encouraging um, is that we're, we're really going to reduce the life-threatening collapse. So always telling people we're not going to turn their animals into racehorses, uh, but we are going to really diminish the, the chance of having a life-threatening event in the park. Um, uh, we really improved the sleeping problems, sleep apnea, the breathing sounds improve, and there's a lot more um, ability to exercise, uh, tolerate heat. But we always tell people, um, even though there's going to be a really important improvement in quality of life, they always have to be treated quite carefully because they're always at risk for heat stroke and issues. Um, and also really important to know that many of these patients <clears throat> do have to have repeat surgery. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not a one-time fix. <coughs> Excuse me, about half the patients may require multiple procedures. Anesthesia, again, it could be a lecture in and of itself, but know that there are related complications to the anesthetics in these breakthrough patients that can be really significantly higher than the complications we might see in regular patients generally. Stress, airway obstruction, aspiration pneumonia, um, and other gastrointestinal diseases are really what we worry about. 
Um, so yeah, they can have about a, um, you know, four times more likely to have a complication, regurgitation, aspiration, pneumonia, than patients that are non brachycephalic So, um, you know, the, the longer the anesthesia, the more overweight or increasing body weight of these patients and the severity of their disease do seem to be factors associated with these patients having a higher rate of complications. So tips and tricks, really having these patients prepared and having you prepared, making sure you have enough staff to help you, making sure you have a crash cart that's fully stocked with emergency drugs, um, and really going slow, slow, slow with your anesthetic recuperation and recovery, quiet time, sternal recovery, having suction around and available. Being prepared with supplemental oxygen, nasal prongs can be really helpful. Um, and there's a, one study that actually is looking at things like nebulizing epinephrine to help reduce uh, the severity of the BOAS index, and that can be used preoperatively uh, or postoperatively in these patients, and that may reduce some of the swelling um, of their airway. Always be prepared with medications to reduce anxiety. Um, we have to use them sparingly, and um, that may be depending on your choice, ace promazine, metatomidine, you know, whatever you're most comfortable with, but we don't want them over sedate because we don't want them to have such a relaxed airway that they're unable to keep uh, open their airway. So um, we do often try to kind of keep their mouth gently open as we can, because if they're too relaxed, all of the extra and edematous tissue may obstruct their airway. So nice little tip is to have uh, some uh, rolled um, cardboard or something that can keep their uh, airway open, help them. Um, keeping nasal prongs on hand, making sure you're measuring pulse oximetry and what a nice happy patient afterwards with a nice 100% pulse ox is what we want to see. Cats, um, again, very briefly, they can have abnormal anatomy as well. And um, repairing of the nares is the most common uh, thing that we'll have to repair in kittens. Very unlikely for them to have issues with their palate or pharynx or larynx, um, but we do see some animals that have some minor obstruction from their external nares. So how are we doing? Um, again, the nice thing to know is that um, the proportion of dogs that are fixed with surgery is pretty high. So about 90% of the patients are gonna have improved quality of life, um, breathing abilities, exercise tolerance after surgery. The more sophisticated we've gotten with our anesthetic techniques and our surgical techniques, we've really seen um, a drop in the, the mortality associated with surgical interventions. Um, the nice thing is for these patients and their clients that the improvement is pretty immediate after surgery. So we see pretty immediate improvement in the sound and the work of breathing. It does take a few weeks before we really appreciate all the swelling that comes down and how they're going to breathe. Um, but uh, a huge amount of these cases may have recurrence of clinical signs. So it's great short-term fix, improvement of their quality of life, um, but um, there is a very good chance that they're going to have a recurrence of these clinical signs as more tissue everts, sometimes more collapse occurs. And so um, we are going to see a lot of these patients back again, um, generally for medical management, but occasionally for surgical intervention. So hopefully these videos will show some happy and quieter patients. So this is at home a couple weeks after surgery. The patient uh, sends us a video showing you know, how quiet their pug is compared to what it was before surgery. So quite, quite happy. And then immediately post-operatively, the, the patient that was making a lot of noise earlier, just, just after surgery is already trotting around and uh, having a whole lot less noise and work of breathing, which is just fantastic. So kind of what are the take home messages here? You know, surgery is not a cure. It's not gonna fix their condition long term, um, but it is going to give them a huge improvement, make their quality of life better. Um, there are lots of newer techniques that have, uh, surgical and anesthesia techniques that have improved our safety uh, parameters and always be ready and prepared for an emergency in all of these cases, because it can happen. Really important to educate our owners about the expectations, the complications. Um, again, ga gastrointestinal disease is going to be a big issue, which um, uh, my associate is going to cover in just a few minutes. Um, that may complicate not only our recuperation and recovery, um, but may need medications in the short or long term, and sometimes um, in interventions for their gastrointestinal tract as well. Um, and the last thing is that um, you know while they're always going to have to modify their lifestyle, if we can intervene 
more quickly in an earlier age before these patients um, develop laryngeal collapse seems that we're going to have a better um, improved outcome. So some happy patients with an improved airways following surgery, always nice to see. Generally speaking, we do have a lot of brachycephalic dogs that come to see us through the clinic at London Vet Specialist. Um, and so, um, you know, we're happy to take referrals. If you have any questions about any of the cases that you've seen here, any cases that you're working on in your clinic, or any cases that you uh, would like to send through to, to London Vet Specialist, please do let us know. We're happy um, to, to take these referrals through, answer any questions. Um, certainly, we are open to having visitors. So if you want to come and watch some of these procedures, uh, happy to entertain you for visits at all. Um, I guess we're located in um, Belsize Village by Hampstead. Um, and um, again, happy to uh, offer a full range of referral and specialist services. So if you have any questions, please do let us know. And I'm going to turn over things to the second half to my associate, who's going to talk about how gastrointestinal disease impacts um, our brachycephalic population. So very nice to see you all and have a great day.